Welcome to the McMillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire host, and our guest is Marcia C. Inhorn. She is the William K. Lamman Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs at Yale University and a former president of the Society for Medical Anthropology of the American Anthropological Association. Professor Inhorn is the author of many award-winning books, including The New Arab Man and Cosmopolitan Conceptions, IVF Sojourns in Global Dubai. Today we'll talk with Professor Inhorn about her new book, America's Arab Refugees, Vulnerability and Health on the Margins. Welcome, Professor Inhorn. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Yes, it's great to have you on again. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your newest book. Tell us about it. Yeah, this book is probably the first anthropological account of the situation facing Arab refugees who've come into the United States um, over the past decades. Um, and it's a book that really explains the difficulties um, and why people fled from the Middle Eastern region because of all the conflict mm -hmm. that's been going on in the region, you know, again, for decades. And this book is called America's Arab Refugees because in a way my main goal, I think, is to show how America's involvement in conflict in the Middle Eastern region has, in fact, led to overwhelming problems of refugee flight, especially from the countries of Iraq and Afghanistan, not an Arab country, but a Middle Eastern country, the wars that are really ongoing in those countries, and then, obviously, the crisis now in Syria mm -hmm. and increasingly in Yemen, yeah, so yeah. that there really are some serious conflicts in which America is involved that have led to the flight of millions of Arab refugees and only a very small percentage of them are getting into the U.S., um, but they're here. Mm -hmm. And this book really looks at what happens um, to Arab refugees in this country. Okay, and a lot of your work um, is done overseas, but this, this book really is centered in the United States. Um, what led you um, to pursue this? Yeah, to be honest, I was never really intending to write a book about Arab refugees in America, but they were a population that I discovered in a project that took place between uh, an anthropological study in Lebanon and an anthropological study in the United Arab Emirates. And during a period of about five years, I ended up going back and forth to what is probably the largest Arab ethnic enclave community in America, which is in the greater metropolitan Detroit, Michigan, the city of Detroit, and particularly uh, an, an area called Dearborn, um, which scholars have dubbed Arab Detroit, because there are as many many as 400,000, maybe even a half million Arabs living in this part of wow. this um, part of Detroit. And I was working in a health clinic um, in Dearborn, and most of the people that I started seeing and I started talking to were actually uh, men and women who had fled from war zones. You know, many were Iraqi refugees who had come either from the first Gulf War or the war that started in 2003. Mm -hmm that the U.S. started in 2003, or they were from the southern parts of Lebanon um, and had fled um, during that long conflict that started in 1975 in Lebanon and lasted until the year 2000. So they, these were people who had fled. Um, they were living in Michigan. And frankly, most of them were not doing that well, sort of economically. They were facing a lot of hardship as refugees in this country. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the methodology you used for the book. I know you did a lot of interviews. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we anthropologists, we have sort of two ways. We call our methodology ethnography, which is really either, you know, interviews, very in-depth interviews with people, sometimes hour long, you know, hours long interviews, and a lot of what we call participant observation, hanging about um, and sort of participating uh, with people as they're going about their da daily lives. And so in this study, I worked with almost 100 um, Arab men and women, mostly men actually, um, and they were all presenting at a clinic um, in Dearborn that was uh, really an Arab serving clinic. The physician there was an Arab, spoke Arabic, and they were coming 
in this case because they had serious reproductive health problems, rather daunting problems that required a lot of intervention and a lot of money that most of them really mm -hmm. could ill afford. So I was really looking at how you know, in uh, America our healthcare system, which is a private healthcare system where you have to pay for your healthcare services, mm -hmm. was really not serving this very vulnerable refugee population, uh, people who were basically impoverished. And something that we forget about um, is the level of poverty in a lot of American big cities. Detroit, as a city, is considered to be the poorest big city right. in America, yet it has taken in a disproportionate share of the Arab refugee um, population. Mm -hmm. In fact, the three states that have the highest number of Arab, Arab refugees are California, then Michigan, then Texas. And so a state that has its own economic problems is in a way trying to cope with a huge influx of refugees that are either getting placed there or who choose to m migrate there because there is a sort of Arab community to which they can, you know, belong. Mm -hmm. So in talking to these men um, and some women, mm -hmm. what were some of the trends that you saw? Most of these men had been through horrific things in the wars. Um, you know, some had lived under Saddam Hussein, um, had been conscripted into the army, um, some had spent years in prison, um, some had been tortured, um, some had fled, their family members had been killed. Um, they fled often with very little. Um, some of the Iraqis had fled through Saudi Arabia and were placed in refugee camps in Saudi Arabia before they made their way to the United States. And so they had been through some grueling, grueling, you know, and difficult and health demoting circumstances. And the book really uh, looks at what are the health costs of conflict? What happens to people physically, mentally, you know, infrastructurally? What happens to families when they're forced to flee um, mm -hmm. because of a conflict? And and really my book shows all of these detrimental sort of circumstances that people bring with them in a way when they come to the States. Um, and then the book really looks at resettlement in America mm -hmm. uh, and how the U.S. has or has not really put in sufficient effort into refugee resettlement. Um, interestingly, uh, after the Vietnam War, there were hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese refugees who made their way to this country. And in those days, back in the early 1980s, um, the U.S. government did do its best to support, you know, Vietnamese families. They often got three years of cash assistance. They were helped to get jobs. They were helped to get their lives, you know, up and running. Mm -hmm. And over the years, the sort of um, assistance given to refugees has just gotten less and less and less. Now, refugees are lucky if they get eight months of cash assistance. They're told to get jobs immediately because they need to be, you know, self-sufficient mm -hmm. before a year is out. And so they often end up in very low-paying, minimum wage jobs. Right. They often are scraping by. And so they end up in a situation of real chronic poverty. Mm -hmm. They never really can get off the ground. Often they have skills that they bring with them. Some of the people I worked with had been engineers. They had been professionals in their home countries. They come to the United States and they're working as busboys in restaurants mm -hmm. or you know, they're not working in professional. They get no recertification. They often don't have English because they don't get time to get English mm -hmm. language skills down. So it's a, it, the term that we use in medical anthropology is structural vulnerability. These people, because of their position in society, coming as refugees, no English, low income, you know, um, sometimes poor educational backgrounds, very little money, no social support systems, living in a city that's impoverished, they are very vulnerable. And they often, their lives end up being fairly vulnerable as they go along. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all, you know, unfortunate stories. There were a few people in my study who had actually done surprisingly well. And I tried to sort of showcase the sort of mm -hmm. hope and aspiration and desire for a new life, a better life in America, mm -hmm. you know. Can you tell the story about one of them? Yeah, there was a, a man, I call him Kamal. That was not his, uh, you know, real name. but. He was fortunate in that he had come with his two brothers. There were three. He had been in the army under Saddam Hussein. He had seen horrific things. He had survived. And he fled with his two brothers. And they were all placed together as a sort of group of three brothers mm -hmm. in you know, this Detroit community. 
And together, because the three of them sort of supported each other, they were able to slowly sort of make a life. He ended up eventually owning two small businesses. They bought two small fixer-upper homes. Um, and so they sort of began achieving the American dream of home ownership, of being a small business entrepreneur. And he was able to accrue enough money. He had a very serious male infertility problem, which who knows, it could have been related to the sort of toxic exposures of the Iraq war. Um, but he ended up being able to use a technology, it's a variant of in vitro fertilization, that helped him to have a baby with his wife. And it was expensive. I mean, to do that technology in America usually costs more than 12,000 US dollars. He had his one shot of doing it, and he was very lucky to have wow. a baby. So he was a happy person. You know, mm -hmm. he told me his story. He, sh you know, showed me the pictures of his son. and. He was, you know, what I would call a sort of a refugee success story. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, here in New Haven, we have an amazing sort of community of, of support for refugees through IRIS, our refugee resettlement agency, mm -hmm. Yale, through the legal services of Yale, the medical services of Yale Medical School. And so there are refugees, especially from Iraq and increasingly from Afghanistan and Syria, who are coming here and are beginning to sort of shape their lives. And I can name success stories right here in the Yale system. Mm -hmm. So refugees can do well, but I would argue in my book that the majority are vulnerable, mm -hmm. very structurally vulnerable, and they have a lot of health problems that are just not being dealt with. Mm -hmm. In your book, do you offer um suggestions on what we can do in this country to improve the situation of not only Arab refugees but other refugees? Yeah, I believe, and I think this is maybe my strongest message of the book, is that America has a moral responsibility to refugees, especially refugees coming from countries in which America started the wars that led to the displacement and the destroyed lives of people. And for me, the wars that really matter in this millennium are the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. And America is also very much involved from the uh, the air, at least, in terms of dropping American armaments on Syria, on Yemen, on Libya, the places that are war zones in the Middle East. And so if you make a war and you break a country, you have a responsibility for fixing the country and fixing the lives of people you know, whose lives you've destroyed. And I think others share my sentiments. We have a moral responsibility to refugees from countries where we've, you know, we started wars. And so for me, I think the main story of this book is the Iraqi refugee story that we never talk about anymore because, you know, Iraq, the war was started, what, in 2003? Supposedly it ended in 2011, but it really hasn't ended. There's still American troops on the ground mm -hmm. in that country. There's still people fleeing that country. The three major groups of refugees coming out of the Middle East are from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and certainly there are going to be Yemenis coming out of the region, too. And so I do feel that as a society, we do have a moral responsibility to help, not only in just giving humanitarian aid, but when, in bringing all the people who are seeking asylum in our country. And right now, I'll tell you that the priority, if there is priority being given to refugees, it's for men who have helped the US military in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're given special immigrant visas called SIVs to come to this country. And so they're being prioritized. But there are many other people from those countries who, you know, who need, need refuge. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody needs to help those families that are stuck in refugee camps in you know, various countries. And so I believe you know, some of the crucial things we need to really give people a good period of assistance. They need to be housed. They need to be given sustainable jobs, and they need to get English so that they can, you know, participate mm -hmm. in American society. It should be longer than eight months. You know, we need to really restore the kind of benefits that used to be available. And I also want to say, right now in this year, we are at the lowest level of refugee admissions, really in recent history, you know, lower than even in 1980 because of the current political regime right. in which we're living and the sort of resistance to bringing immigrants and refugees into this country. Although I must say, no refugee has ever committed an act of terrorism on US soil. No refugee of any kind. And so refugees have been a law-abiding population in this country. 
And so we can't lump them in as a sort of, you know, group of dangerous people because mm -hmm. most of them have proven that they're not dangerous. Right. And we need to do something to support those people. And that's really what my book is arguing. The kind of conclusion of my book is a call for sort of justice, if you will, um, for, you know, Arab refugees around the world. Well, hopefully that will come. Hopefully that will come, inshallah. Thank you for being here with us today and sharing some of your work, Marcia. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you very much. For more information about Professor Inhorn and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.